Okay, so I hope everyone is finding themselves safe and sound tonight. I do want to introduce a brand new innovative program that Chesapeake Urology is hosting. I'm very excited to announce that we will be working on a program that's optimizing lifestyle uh, outcomes for prostate cancer treatment patients focusing on erectile recovery and continence recovery. Um, this is a great program, really one of a kind, uh, that is going to be available for patients. We're gonna go over kind of what causes erectile dysfunction and incontinence after prostate cancer treatment, what we can do to kind of optimize it and how this program kind of plays into that um, to really get you plugged into the great care that you need um, in a very innovative fashion. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. As you um, heard, I do specialize in uh, male sexual health, erectile dysfunction, and urinary incontinence. Um, and I have helped develop a recovery program um, that focuses on these areas, as well as something that I like to call a penile length preservation protocol. And that's done after prostatectomy or prostate cancer surgery as well. Um, in addition, I do some uh, specialized surgery, um, as you can see there, and help out with um, gentlemen that also have penile curvature. Um, so that's kind of my background, my knowledge base, and I'll be utilizing some of that as we discuss um, the program here tonight. So the Recovery Coach Program is really a state-of-the-art program, and it's using a telehealth platform, and it's also gonna have some office visits. And this really ensures that men facing prostate cancer not only have the best oncological outcomes or cancer outcomes um, from their treatments, but also have the best lifestyle outcomes. Many men come to me and they're very concerned about, you know, not only that they have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, but what this can mean for them in the long run um, is they hear about some of the side effects that can result from treatment, um, such as changes in their erectile function, changes in their continence. Um, and this program really goes side by side the men as they go through this process of you know, having their cancer treated and optimizing their outcomes, ensuring that they have the best possible um, recovery for their erectile function and for their continence. And for gentlemen that, you know, never achieve those goals of where they want to be, we have lots of treatment options to get you back to where you have in mind for your goals in terms of, you know, treatment options that we have available. So this is all an introductory to that program. So let's kind of start from the beginning. You've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And we're going to go kind of through the whole pathway. So we're going to talk about the lifestyle changes that can occur from the treatment. Um, we'll get you kind of what I call game day ready for your treatment. Um, take you down that recovery pathway after your treatment. And um, go over some of those treatment options if you're not exactly where you want to be in terms of meeting your goals, um, you know, six months, 12 months after surgery or radiation treatments. So any form of treatment for prostate cancer can have some impact on the erections or continence. And this effect can either be short-term and correct itself over time, or it can be long-term to permanent. And every different man is gonna end up in a different area in the spectrum. The majority of men are gonna recover a majority of their function, um, but there will be some men, and it's hard to predict who, um, will have, you know, changes uh, that last with them for a long time, and they would desire to have some type of intervention or treatment to help them out um, in regaining their goals. So men that are empowered with the knowledge of how to best prepare their bodies for treatment, how to recover after their treatment, and the treatment options for both erectile function and incontinence do better from both a functional standpoint and from a personal satisfaction standpoint. Having that knowledge just really gives you the wherewithal to know where to best go for your own health. Um, and not having it just kind of leaves you feeling a little bit underprepared, um, nervous, and um, this is really a good way um, to get you feeling that confidence that you need to, to go forward with your treatments. So there's a lot of literature out there that talks about what are the rates of incontinence 
or erectile dysfunction after certain treatments, such as prostate cancer treatment with surgery, which is called a prostatectomy, or with radiation. And you know, we could talk numbers all day long, but my take on it is really, if it happens to you, it feels like 100%. And that's the number that really matters to me. Um, because if you're going through these things and uh, you're feeling those effects, it doesn't really matter what the statistics say. It just matters that that's what you're experiencing. Um, so it's, it's a fair assessment to say that while the, the numbers are very low in terms of the overall statistics, again, it's that personal experience that really matters to me. And if it's happened to you, to me, that that qualifies as 100%. So it's important before we get into treatment for the gentleman to take a good look in the mirror and take an honest self-assessment about how your erectile function is prior to treatment and how your bladder health is. So as men age, they can naturally experience some changes in function, um, you know, with their strength of erection, frequency of erection, firmness, um, or with their urinary habits, you know, are they able to make it to the bathroom in time? Do they have some leakage if they, they don't get there in time? So really kind of taking some self-reflection and say, where am I at prior to my treatment can really help you um, set expectations and goal management for after treatment. Um, and it also helps your doctor make a treatment plan with kind of a framework of knowing where you started from can really help us out knowing where you might end up after treatments. Um, so the other thing that I tell gentlemen is when they come in to see me is that no matter what treatment you have for your prostate cancer, it's not going to make your erections better. So wherever you are prior to surgery, after surgery, you will most likely experience some change. Um, if you stay the same as you were before surgery, great, but most men will have some decline in their erectile function after surgery. So if you weren't requiring pills before surgery, you might require a pill like Viagra Cialis afterwards. If you were already on pills prior to surgery, you might need something a little bit more advanced for after surgery. So that, that's what I mean by it can kind of help direct your treatment goals. Um, so the changes um, that you'll experience after you have your treatment typically take a span of six to 12 months to really see where things shake out as. So either of the treatments have an impact on the nerves, and we're going to go into some detail about that in a moment. But um, that's why initially after treatment, you might have more significant changes to your erectile function and urinary status, particularly with the prostate surgery, and this will get better over time. With radiation, those changes that you see will occur later on down the road um, because the mechanism of the radiation tends to change the cells over the long period of time. So surgery is kind of an upfront type of change and it gets better with time. Radiation is more of a gradual change um, and you might see continued decrease in um, function over a longer period of time. Um, so the chances of improving these um, functions, your erections, and your continence are greatly, greatly improved if you are in some type of program or coaching that helps you along the way to your recovery. So this can include things such as physical therapy, having an erectile um, or incontinent specialist like a urologist, um, or having a knowledge base. And so that's kind of where the, the uh, impetus to develop this program came from, um, was that we saw in the data and the literature and from patients' personal experiences that if you have someone alongside you with this recovery goal, you're going to do a lot better. So if you think of like a nutritionist with weight loss goals, it's the same type of thing. So a lot of gentlemen uh, want to know why exactly do these side effects occur from prostate cancer treatment. So when we look at these images here, um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but hopefully you can. So you have your bladder, the prostate sits just below the bladder, and then your 
urethra is the tube that goes through the penis that carries the urine out. So um, when you urinate, that's the urine coming through the urethra. So when we do treatment for prostate cancer, so if it's done by surgery, you'll see the image on um, your right side of the screen, which shows that the prostate has been removed. But you can see that those yellow lines are the nerves. And so those nerves are right in this area. During surgery, we do our best effort to sweep those nerves down and away, but you can imagine the inflammation and the scar tissue that occurs after having um, you know, the trauma of surgery to the area. And that in itself, we think can cause some erectile dysfunction, even if the nerves were spared. Now, if we're talking about radiation, the radiation field is going to encompass this entire area. So you're going to have those um, erectile nerves that are also encompassed in the radiation area. Now both of these things are very necessary to get you the cure for the cancer or the treatment for the cancer to optimize your best cancer outcomes, but unfortunately because of the proximity of these nerves, that's why you can have some dysfunction in both the erections and the, and the urine um, continence after treatment. So taking a little bit of a different view at this, we're looking at the pelvic floor now. So the pelvic floor is a series of six muscles and it basically creates a bowl at the bottom of your body. And to be frank, it's, I always say it's the kind of the bowl that holds all the guts up. Um, so it holds all your insides up. This muscle layer um, is also very important for things of pelvic pain. So if you have pain that radiates to the testicles, penis, or anus, a lot of times that can be from pelvic floor dysfunction. So that's a whole nother topic and talk um, for another night. But you can see the proximity when we're talking about the prostate to that pelvic floor. So um, the nerves also track through this area. So you can have also um, some implications uh, after treatment from you know, both inflammatory standpoint causing discomfort. Um, it can cause changes to the function. So that strength layer here um, helps with your continence after surgery. So you can imagine that once this prostate has been removed or the radiation has been in this field, you might have some weakening of these muscles. And so pelvic floor physical therapy, which is one of the tools that we utilize in the recovery program, helps strengthen this and can help you get back to earlier um, continence or becoming dry again after your procedure. So a very important um, aspect to your recovery pathway is re-strengthening that pelvic floor. Um, and we utilize our um, pelvic floor physical therapy partners for that. Looking over here um, on the right side of the screen, you can see a network of kind of yellow and green squiggly lines. And those are gonna cascade down through the pelvis and you'll see them kind of innervate and join in the back of the bladder to the prostate and to the penis area. And this just gives us a kind of a different view of how important um, all of these um, organs are in proximity to each other. They're all very close, but also how those nerves interplay. So even when your, your surgeon does, you know, a perfect nerve spare or the radiation oncologist really targets that um, prostate area, there's a lot of things in close proximity. And so um, doing a treatment pathway and being with a recovery coach can kind of optimize how we recover this nerve health after your treatments and get you the best possible outcomes. So when we're talking about prostate cancer, um, definitely, uh, men, you are not alone. This is um, one of the most uh, and most common causes of uh, cancer in gentlemen. And in a lifetime, it's going to occur in about one out of seven gentlemen. And this year alone, an estimated uh, 191,000 men are going to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Now, the good news, the excellent news, is that the treatment options that we've been discussing have an excellent 98% uh, 10 year survival rate, meaning that if you get di diagnosed with what's called localized disease, so not metastatic disease, over 10 years you have a 98% survival rate with treatment. And so that's just really important to think about in terms of, you know, when you're making your decisions about, you know, based on your conversations with your doctor, if this is the type of prostate cancer that warrants a treatment, um, you know, which uh, pathway you're going to go down with that because the, the outcomes are, are very excellent. Um, and the most common treatments are either going to be surgery or radiation as we've talked about. 
So when we talk about particularly in surgery, um, I want to kind of give some education about what happens to your bladder control after surgery. Thinking back to our uh, anatomy diagrams, remember how close that bladder, prostate, and urethra are in proximity to each other. And so the, you can understand that once that prostate is removed from that area, there's going to be a recovery period after your surgery. So all men leak after their prostatectomy. And so this leakage is expected. And the other aspect of that is that this helps um, men understand, you know, with the anatomy knowledge, why it happens, but it also allows them to understand that they will recover um, some of their function, they will get better. So when we're talking about um, the rates of leakage, um, this really, if you look at the data, can range from one to 40%. Now you might be thinking about it, it's a crazy range. And it really comes down to what you define leakage as. So some men are going to feel that leakage occurs when they have a few drops of urine come out and um, you know that causes a little dampness. And some men are going to consider leakage only when they have a full bladder loss. And so you have a very wide range of what that definition is. So if you're looking at things online and you see all these different numbers, that's where it's coming from. Um, it just depends on that definition. So talking about leakage, there's also two types of leakage. So one of them is stress urinary incontinence. That's gonna be most common after your surgery. So that's going to be when you have a leakage with strain or cough. So thinking back to that pelvic floor, that musculature that's sitting underneath your organs, that is going to be a little bit weaker after surgery because of the inflammation and the healing process. So if you have weakness and you don't have that tight muscle control that used to be part of the prostate, the sphincter, when that's removed, you're now relying completely on that pelvic floor function for your continence. And so you have to do um, some strengthening exercises to regain that, that continence. Now, some men always have a little bit of leak that happens with strain. And that's because if you're having force from the belly that can overcome the strength of that pelvic floor, you're gonna have some leakage that comes through. Um, so stress urinary incontinence, very common for gentlemen after surgery. Um, and again, that's gonna be you know, laugh, cough, um, straining leakage. Urge urinary incontinence is the type of incontinence or leakage when you, you feel like you gotta go and you just can't get to the bathroom in time. The urine's already starting to come. So it's that I gotta go and I gotta go right now that's gonna be a little bit more common with radiation. So the, the thing about radiation is that it's gonna have an incorporated field and in, incorporate the bottom of the bladder just by nature of how close that prostate is to make sure everything gets treated appropriately. Um, so when the radiation field kind of catches the little bit part of the bladder, you can have um, irritation to the bladder that can cause some of this urge urinary incontinence. Um, so again, that can be uh, treated uh, in a variety of ways, which we'll talk briefly about as well. And I know I keep harping on this, but it is so very important. So big part of our recovery coach pathway is to get you in touch with pelvic floor physical therapists that can help you do exercises. Many of you will be familiar with the term Kegels um, to help you get drier quicker. Again, that strengthening that pelvic floor to get you that strength to control your urinary um, continence, um, and they will give you the exercises that you need to help regain that continence quicker. So now let's move on to the erection. So uh, as we talked about, really important to take in a self-assessment about where you are prior to your treatments. Um, again, treatment is not going to make your erections better. Um, at best, they're not going to change. Most often, you're going to have some decrease in your function. That's going to be different for every different man. I will say that if you have good, strong erectile function prior to treatment, you have a much better chance of recovering your erections um, to a good, strong point after treatment. If you are already struggling with your erections, pills maybe not working very well for you prior to treatment, um, 
those are going to be the gentlemen that are going to be looking at most likely more advanced options that we have available for helping recover your erections. Um, so, you know, kind of getting that self-assessment before treatment is very important. Um, and we talked about, you know, that even with the nerve spare, the inflammation that's in the, the pelvis after surgery likely causes some injury to those nerves, and you can still have changes in your function after surgery despite having a great nerve spare. So the most important piece of recovering your erectile function is to be aggressive about it. So erections are all based on blood flow. The more we can optimize your blood flow to the pelvis, the better your erections are gonna be. Um, I'm gonna talk about this pathway a little bit more in detail, but kinda to put it in a, a framework that you can um, start to think about, if you were going to have a shoulder surgery, um, you know, you wouldn't blink an eye at having um, physical therapy after surgery to recover your function. And so I'd like you guys to start thinking about it that way for recovering your, your continence function and your erectile function after the procedure. It's just part of that package. The more aggressive you are with that recovery pathway, the better your chances of attaining your goals um, to where you want to be back to after your treatment. So let's talk specifically about this recovery coach um, program outline. Um, so on the right hand side, you're gonna see a list of physicians that are with Chesapeake Urology that are our recovery coaches. Um, everyone on this list is a specially trained um, ED and continence specialist that has extra knowledge and training to best um, facilitate these goals for gentlemen. Um, so prior to undergoing your treatment, you're gonna meet with one of these recovery specialists and we're gonna talk, kind of get baselines in terms of where are you at prior to surgery and what are your goals for after surgery. Um, you'll meet with their, your recovery coach again at three months and or six months, depending on your schedule. And we're gonna try and reassess your markers of where you're at at those time points in terms of your erection function and continence function, and then reassess how close you are to your goals of where you'd like to be. After that point, if you're in a good place and you're making continued progress, we'll have you see one of our um, physician's assistants, one of the PAs, and that'll be, you know, through telehealth platform. All of this can be through, through the telehealth platform to ensure that you continue to meet your goals through the long term. If at any point, you're not satisfied with where you're at and you wanna flip back and see your recovery coach physician, you just make an appointment and we're right there for you. So prior to your treatment, you're going to get information and you're gonna get plugged in with a physical uh, pelvic floor physical therapist. And they're gonna make an assessment and they're gonna give you exercises to do after your surgery to help um, regain that continence um, and that strength. As I said, you'll do baseline questionnaires, and you may actually get started on medications or therapy even prior to your treatments. These can help increase your blood flow, um, help increase your function prior to surgery. It's just like training for a race. The better shape that you are in before you get to the, the start line at the race, the better you're gonna feel at the finish line. So um, there's a lot of different things that we can do to help optimize you. Um, and you're always encouraged to bring a significant other partner to the appointment if you have one, because it can be stressful um, on a couple to go through these types of treatments and to know where you're, um, the road that's ahead of you um, and have both parties on board with the same expectations and knowledge can be really helpful. Um, and then we'll expect talk about your expected timeframes for recovery and trajectories. So the benefits of this program in particular is you're gonna be connected with all of these specialists who already have networked with um, you know, the pelvic floor therapist and everything else that's really gonna optimize the management. The other benefit is that we directly are partners with and work with the people treating your prostate cancer. So the ones that are doing your surgeries for your prostatectomy or prostate surgery or your radiation are also people that we work with. And so all of these notes are shared amongst us. And so we have excellent communication um, about your care. And it's really going to optimize your journey. So, you know, it's not you know, one wall not looking at the other wall and you kind of standing in the middle trying to um, facilitate that communication, we do that on our end. Um, so this is really going to improve, you know, your 
continence recovery shortens that time to dry, as I like to say. And if you are having continued problems with leakage at that six or 12 month time frame, then we can talk about options that would best treat your, your incontinence if you're still facing that. And then, you know, in that recovery pathway for the erection, same thing, you know, this is gonna optimize that chance of recovering the erections in a natural manner. And if they're not meeting your goals, then we have advanced treatment options for erectile dysfunction to help to get you to that quality of life you're looking for. So after treatment, Again, at the three and six month visit, there's gonna be similarities. We're gonna do questionnaires at both visits um, and assess where you're at for your um, erectile and um, bladder function. At three month visit, if you have clearance from your treating physician, your surgeon or your um, radiation specialist, we'll get you started on uh, vacuum stretching therapy. That's gonna help maintain not only the length of the penis, but it's also gonna help maintain good blood flow into the penis. I call it yoga for the penis. You wanna have that good pliability, you wanna have that good blood flow, it's going to make those tissues as healthy as possible. Um, and then at the three month visit, we can start talking about some more advanced options um, for the recovery pathway. This might include oral medications. Sometimes we do injection therapy. Uh, we may do an ultrasound of the penis to look at blood flow. So there's a lot of different options and it's all tailored to your care. Um, you'll continue with those pelvic floor physical therapy exercises. They're extraordinarily important. At your six month visit, um, again with the questions, but then we're gonna assess at that point, how close or how far are you from your goals? Um, because at that point, at the six month point, if we haven't made any progress, if you've really plateaued and there hasn't been any change, we're gonna start thinking a little bit more uh, aggressively at some advanced options to help you. However, if you're having a continued improvement trajectory, that can continue through, you know, up to a year after surgery. So you still have a lot of time to, to continue your recovery pathway. Um, and so that's, you know, just those last two bullet points there, really just talking about that 12 month time frame. So if we're starting to notice that there's, you know, we're plateauing, we haven't regained the function that we're looking for, you've tried, you know, the pills, you've tried the injections, you've tried vacuum, and your erections are still not where you want them to be after your surgery um, or your radiation treatment for your prostate cancer, we have surgical options that can um, treat your erectile dysfunction. I always tell men we can get you back to erections no matter what. Um, and this is one of those advanced treatment options and all of those care pathway um, and recovery coaches that you saw listed um, can talk to you about the, the penile implant, but this is one of the um, really amazing devices that is given so many men back function um, that had kind of uh, given up on hope. So this is a really powerful tool that we have to offer um, for men that have struggled with their erections. Um, so the other surgical option in terms of the incontinence, we have two things. So for men, you know, and they're reaching that 12 month time point, they're still leaking, they're very bothered by their leakage. They've tried their pelvic floor physical therapy and it's just not working. Um, and they want another treatment option to get them dry, we have two options. One is the sling and one is the artificial urinary sphincter. So the sling is good for men that have mild leakage. So if you're you know, wearing a light pad um, and you may wear you know, one, two, or maybe three if they're light um, pads per day and um, you have periods where you're dry, but it's more when you do those stress type movements yet you notice more of that leakage, a sling can be a really good option for those men. An artificial urinary sphincter is what we have pictured here. And this is a mechanical device um, that gets implanted into, into the man and through just a single incision. Um, and this is going to be really good for those men that have heavier leakage. So men that are having you know, full bladder loss, if they're wearing you know, several heavy pads per day, or if they've had both radiation and surgery, um, tend to do best with this um, artificial urinary sphincter or otherwise is shortened to AUS and we can go over those options with you as well. So 
probably the most important slide of tonight's presentation is how do you get yourself into this program? So if you are with one of the Chesapeake urologists and they're treating your prostate cancer, just ask them and they can help facilitate getting you into this program. Um, if you're watching this tonight and you say, well, I just want to go ahead and uh, get enrolled in the program, you have a couple of ways you can do that. You can schedule a telehealth visit um, through online or by calling uh, the number you see listed there. So if you go online, it's going to be chesapeakeurology.com, um, and you're going to see uh, right away a big box that says uh, schedule your appointment online, and you can go ahead and make an appointment with any of these providers that you see listed here. These are all your recovery coach specialists, and again, these are all specially trained physicians and surgeons. All of us um, are optimized to be able to be able to take the best care of you in this recovery pathway. So that is what I have for us tonight. What questions are out there for me? Thank you, Dr. Mendez. I would like to remind everyone, if you would like to submit a question, please do so through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Mendez, I have a question for you. Can diet play a part in successful recovery and are there any foods I need to avoid? Absolutely. So I will be honest, there's been studies that have looked at, you know, what's the role of diet in um, prostate cancer in terms of outcomes before and after for the cancer itself. But we don't have specific studies that look at the diet for the erectile or urinary recovery. I will say from treating many, many men, the men that are watching their diet, eating, you know, just a well-balanced, healthy diet, limiting the salt. So anything that's going to be good for the heart is going to be good for the penis. It may sound a little bit silly, but it's, it's very, very true. If you think about it, they're both vascular organs. So they're both completely dependent on their blood supply. So if you think about a heart attack, that's a blocked blood vessel. Erectile dysfunction is the blood just not getting into the penis or leaving the penis too soon. So if you can take care of your body with good diet, good exercise, good blood flow, remember is key to those erections, um, you're going to have an improved recovery pathway. The pelvic floor also, you know, is, is just six muscles of um, coordination and that's what helps give you back your continence after surgery. So the more active you are in terms of your exercises, the better you take care of yourself in terms of your diet, maintaining a healthy body weight. If you have uh, a high BMI, trying to lose body fat, all of these things are going to help you in your recovery process and to getting to your goals. I had high foo 18 months ago. Is there any benefit available for me? Absolutely. So I have seen gentlemen that have been 20 years out from their prostate cancer treatment. Um, and there are still things that we can do in terms of your recovery care pathway. Um, so no matter where you are in any stage of your recovery pathway, whether it's been, you know, 10 years, it's going to be in 10 weeks from now, or you're 18 months out, please, you know, please get into the program because we can tailor this to wherever you are in your recovery. We can take the goals that you have, you know, outlined for yourself, see where you're at right now and give you, you know, a very realistic goal and um, pathway to meeting those. Um, so definitely reach out to us um, so, you know, we can give you some tools that you can empower yourself with to, to meeting those goals. I have some bladder discharge after an erection with orgasm sensation. What can be done to stop this? That's another excellent question. So that is actually, it has a name. Um, we call that climacteria. So climacteria is um, very common after uh, prostate cancer surgery. Um, it can also occur with radiation, but um, a little more common with surgery. And like you said, it, it is leakage that can occur after sexual stimulation or with orgasm. Things that can help this. So if you empty your bladder prior to sexual activity, um, some gentlemen have tried what's called a constriction band. Um, colloquially, we call it a cock ring um, that you put at the base of the penis. So you achieve the erection first, 
put on that constriction band, and that can help contain any leakage for when you do climax. And it can also help control any urine drips during sexual activity. Um, some men, if it's just a little bit of urine, can wear a condom to help control um, the leakage. And then for men that are particularly bothered by this and they don't want to have to do those things of wearing constriction band or a condom or anything else like that, um, we do have option to doing uh, a sling, um, as I talked about before, that can have really excellent um, outcomes. There's a paper actually done by one of my colleagues down in Alabama um, who showed 100% uh, continence and dryness um, for men that were experiencing that type of leakage after a sling. Um, so if you are bothered by it and want a procedure, that is available as well. Um, for men that have both erectile dysfunction and mild urinary leakage, and they choose to go down the pathway of a penile implant, a penile implant in itself can help correct very mild leakage. So um, like I said, everything's very unique to every different man and your story. And so there's a lot of nuance in how we can help you. What causes the short-term discomfort after orgasm? Oh, okay. So if you're having some discomfort after orgasm, the most common thing that's going to be causing that is a tight pelvic floor. So if you can remember um, back to that slide where I kind of showed that pelvic floor, that musculature floor of the, the pelvis and how those nerves innervate and go through that floor, after orgasm, that floor is going to tighten. So if you think about the orgasm, everything tightens it can pinch on those nerves and you can have pain that can radiate into the testicles, the penis, deep on the inside, so kind of straight up um, from where you sit on the saddle um, or the rectum. And so if you're having that discomfort after orgasm, um, things like pelvic floor physical therapy, um, sometimes taking some ibuprofen prior to sexual activity can be beneficial, but it's that tight pelvic floor that's giving a pinch on the nerves, most likely. Is there a test that checks blood flow to the penis? There is. So um, there is a special ultrasound. So no radiation. It's an ultrasound that we do in the office. And what we do is we give you a potent medicine to help bring on an erection. Um, that medicine is given by um, a very small injection that goes into the side of the penis. Um, myself or one of the other physicians gives you that medicine. Um, and I always promise the men that it's always the anticipation of it. That's far worse than the actual uh, medication. So then once we've given you the medication, we're able to look at the arterial blood flow, which is the blood flow into the penis, which helps cause the firmness or the actual erection. And then we can also look at, is the blood stain in the penis to uh, help with maintenance of the erection? You can imagine if that blood is leaving the penis too soon and going back to the body, you're going to have a really hard time maintaining that erection. That's something called venous leak. It is very common. Um, both with age, diabetes, heart disease, or if you've had treatment for prostate cancer. And so both of those things we can look at with the penile Doppler ultrasound, um, and that's oftentimes uh, part of the care pathway with the recovery coach program. Why does the penis shorten after prostatectomy? Another excellent question. So kind of going back to my yoga analogy, if we think about a body part that we haven't um, exercised for a while, you can have some contracture of that tissue. What happens after prostatectomy is we have a multitude of different factors or radiation that can happen with both um, that are causing shortening of the tissues on the inside. So the surgery itself or radiation could cause inflammation. Inflammation can cause those um, the pliability or the stretchability of um, tissue to change. It can become constricted and inflamed. If you think about if you've had a scar, how that scar tissue is a little bit tighter and less pliable than the rest of your, your skin, it's similar to the tissues that are inside the penis. And we think that that happens probably because of the proximity um, to the surgery site but or radiation. But the other thing too is if we do know for men that have never had anything, they've never had prostate cancer, they've never had uh, treatments, nothing, they're just natural aging process. If they're men that have erectile dysfunction, just not having erections, that natural blood flow to the penis, that stretch on the tissues, if they're not having their erections, they can also have shortening of the penis with 
time um, and no erections because you're not getting that stretch um, on those tissues. So you're not getting that yoga for the penis, so to speak. So that can cause penile shortening in itself. Um, there's actually a paper that demonstrates for each year of erectile dysfunction where you're not having those regular erections, you can actually lose up to a half a centimeter in length. Um, you know, and that's different for each man, but that, that was um, a pretty shocking statistic for a lot of men. And that, again, that's for just erectile dysfunction um, without association, you know, with any type of treatment. So but getting you in that recovery pathway, we're going to encourage blood flow to the pelvis. We're going to encourage stretch on those tissues um, to help maintain that penile length after your treatment and then help recover those erections so you can therefore in the future continue to maintain your penile length. If, blood, if the blood test shows limited flow to the penis, can that be corrected? So if we do your Doppler and one of the numbers from the Doppler shows that your arterial flow or that blood flow into the penis is weak or not where we want it to be. Things that can help with blood flow are going to include um, the oral medication. So Viagra, Cialis, things like that help kind of relax and dilate those vessels to try and get more blood flow in. Um, other things that can help is something called, um, it's an energy wave treatment to the penis. We call it E-wave, um, but basically it's a uh, shockwave therapy that goes to the penis that helps stimulate angiogenesis, which is development of blood vessels. Um, that can help increase blood flow to the penis. Um, the vacuum erectile device, while itself doesn't change the, the blood vessels, it helps pull blood into the penis to give that stretch. Um, so that can help with the firmness of the erection. Um, there are medications that we can try, um, sometimes amino acids, um, that help improve blood flow. So yes, there are things that we can do um, to help improve that, that arterial flow into the penis. I had a radical prostatectomy five and a half years ago. Can regular use of a vacuum device help increase prospects of a satisfactory erection? So it can. So the what the vacuum device is going to do, so the vacuum device I always call kind of the, the, the mechanical aspect of the treatment. So what I like to tell gentlemen is, you know, we need some type of stimulation to help get blood flow into the penis. That's going to be either, you know, um, oral medication, injection medication. And a lot of times I'll pair that, you know, start of an erection that they have with one of those treatments with putting the, the vacuum device on the penis to pull a little bit more blood into the penis and then potentially putting a ring at the base to help um, optimize that erection. The best thing that I think the vacuum device gives men is not so much for sex, but for that exercise of the tissue, that yoga for the penis. Um, for my gentlemen, I give them an instruction sheet on daily exercises that they can do with their vacuum device, not for sex, but just to optimize the health of the penis. And um, you know, when we have our visit, we kind of go over that instruction sheet. If I have these issues after prostate cancer treatment, does riding a bike or motorcycle make them worse or is that okay? So there's, that's an interesting question. So we always say, and we probably don't have the best data for it, but it's theory um, that you want to take uh, pressure off the perineum. So no bike riding, no motorcycle, nothing like that for the first three months after your prostatectomy or your radiation. The reason being is that if you think of this as like the, the perineum, that space between the testicles and the anus, and if you're putting compression on it by sitting on a motorcycle or a bicycle, that's a high degree of compression. It's squishing those tissues, and so they're not getting that good blood flow. Blood flow is the key element to all tissue recovery and health, and so we worry that it could decrease that recovery process or injure the blood vessels um, that go to the penis. We do know that from like competitive cyclists that are spending five, six hours on their bike at a time, they do tend to have higher rates of arterial erectile dysfunction or that blood flow into the penis um, because they've had such long-term compression on those blood vessels. Um, so we do have some data to, to substantiate these claims, um, but is my personal bias is if you're, you're far out from those um, 
treatments if it's been years and those are activities that you enjoy doing and you're you're not spending hours and hours and hours on your perineum it's fine to engage in those activities as long as you're balancing them out with other things that help increase blood flow so you know exercise um, you know the VED things like that can you talk a little bit about the sling for the incontinence please Sure. So the sling is going to be good for those gentlemen that have that mild leakage. Um, it's done in our surgery center. All of our surgeries are done in our surgery centers, unless there's some reason that you need um, more close monitoring from your anesthesiologist. Um, so the for the sling procedure, you come in, this, the procedure itself takes about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, somewhere in there, um, where you have a small incision. It's about that big, if you can kind of see from the, the screen here, um, where an incision is made just below um, the testicles in that space between the base of the testicles and the anus, um, and the sling is placed in that area. And then your recovery from that surgery is going to be about four weeks where we don't want you doing any heavy lifting. We don't want you doing any squatting down or anything like that because it can actually loosen the sling. But what the sling is doing is if you think about the urethra. So if my hand is the bladder, see, I'm going to turn it this way so we can see a little bit better. So if my hand is the bladder and the urethra is coming down and out the penis this way, what the sling is going to do is it's going to help support the urethra where the pelvic floor muscles kind of sit. And so what it's doing is it's giving a little bit different angulation, some support to the urethra, um, that otherwise that laxity might have been, you know, caused after surgery. So giving that support back and it's not mechanical. So once it's in place, you can kind of forget about it and it should give you continued um, function moving forward. Now, some men who have had a sling 10, 15 years later might have had weight changes or body dynamic changes, something like that, and they may have an increase in their leakage again. Um, at that point, we could move forward with either doing another sling or doing that artificial urinary sphincter um, procedure. Can someone who had a prostatectomy or radiation both have a sling? I think the question is, does it matter? If you, whatever type of prostate cancer treatment you've had, is it okay? Are you eligible to have a sling? You are eligible to have a sling. So um, my personal bias is if you've had both treatments. So if you're a gentleman that had surgery and then you had radiation um, for the treatment of your prostate cancer, data supports using an artificial urinary sphincter to help get you dry. The reason being is that you've had kind of two things that have been, um, you know, uh, an insult to the tissues, so to speak. Um, and so something that gives you a little bit more um, control uh, tends to get you drier. Also, those gentlemen tend to have a little bit more leakage um, than men that have had just one form of treatment. Um, but that is not to say that you cannot have the sling. Um, the sling, I have done slings in men that have had just surgery, just radiation, and I have had a handful of men that have had very mild leakage um, that were otherwise, you know, fairly young and healthy. Um, we did the sling in those gentlemen, but I do favor the AUS or the artificial urinary sphincter if you've had both treatments, as I think it, you know, in the literature supports that it gives you a little bit um, better chance of out, you know, dry outcome. When is the artificial sphincter preferred over a sling? So the artificial sphincter, it's a great question, is going to be preferred over the sling for gentlemen that are having heavier leakage. So if you're someone that you stand up and your all your urine comes out, you're going to be best served with that artificial sphincter. The reason being is it gives more control. So the there's a little button that sits down in the scrotum um, and it feels just kind of like the, almost like the tip of your finger. Um, and you just give that a squeeze. That's going to open up that cuff and allow you to pee at the time where you want. That cuff is on kind of a pressure timed mechanism and it's going to close back down and pinch off that urethra to keep you dry in the times where you don't want to have any leakage. And so it's, it gives you a lot of um, control over your, your urinary function. And for men that are having whole bladder loss, they need that tight control of the cuff around the urethra to help them meet their goals of getting towards dry. Um, I always counsel my gentlemen 
gentlemen that no treatment is a perfect treatment, um, but they're they're very good. So if you're someone that has you know heavy leakage, I would expect you know the um, artificial sphincter to get you 90% dry from where you are currently. So you might not be perfect perfect, but it's going to get you a vast majority of the way there. I had an operation eight years ago. I have no incontinence and can have an erection with no pills, but I have no sensitivity on the penis. Is there anything that can be done for this? So for men that have, so that's an interesting um, scenario that you're, you're experiencing. It does happen. The nerves that control the erection and the continence are one set of nerves, and then there's another set of nerves that um, have an impact on sensation. So potentially, you know, there could be something with the nerves for sensation. Um, if you've ever had any back injuries too, that can really affect sensation. Um, but the other thing is the hormones change quite a bit after um, your treatments. And so sometimes we can look at hormonal pathways um, and see if there's areas that we could potentially uh, look at to see if that's maybe, maybe why you're not having good sensation. Um, and there's two different types of sensation. There's men that have, they have tactile sensation, so they can feel touch and things like that, but they can't orgasm. And then there are men that just can't feel anything um, of the like hot, cold, or tactile touch. And that's something that we could discuss more in detail. Can you explain the penile prosthesis and tell how long it lasts? Absolutely. So the penile prosthesis um, really gives men a second chance at you know their you know sexual goals in terms of um, penetrative intercourse um, if they haven't been able to achieve erections with the other treatment modalities. And so um, I really like this therapy. Is I feel like um, men that have undergone this treatment now have their confidence back that they can show up in the moment um, whenever they want to. And so the way that this works, the penile implant, again, is put in through a single incision. It's about this big, I'm trying to show perspective. Uh, and that's done in the surgery center. You go home the same day. Um, the, the way it works is that there's uh, two cylinders that go down the shaft of the penis, all of your anatomy stays the same. So nothing changes about your anatomy. The device is just slipped along your natural anatomy. So nothing changes, nothing's cut away, nothing like that. So the cylinders go down the, the, the penile shaft and then there's a pump that sits down in the scrotum like a third testicle. And then behind the pubic bone sits a reservoir where the fluid can cycle into the cylinders to cause an erection and then can be released back to the reservoir so the penis is flaccid again. And so if you're at the gym or anything else, you're, you're natural and natural. no one would know you have this. Um, you may not even choose to tell your partner and they would not know um, unless you share that with them. Um, when you're ready for an erection, you pump the pump that sits in the scrotum that translates the fluid to give you the erection. It's going to stay there as long as you uh, have it up. Uh, so when you climax, it's not going to go back down. Um, you do have to hit a release button that translates the fluid back to the reservoir. Um, so you have an on-demand erection that lasts as long as you want, um, as many times per day. So that's very nice. The device itself is expected to last 8 to 12 years. I have men that it lasts 20 years, and I have men that it lasts, you know, two years. It's just like cars. Those are extreme. We don't expect those. We expect the average lifespan to be 8 to 12 years, but there can always be an outlier. So I always um, be upfront with gentlemen about that as well. Okay, that concludes our question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendez. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. You will receive a follow-up email about the webinar with a link to the video. You can also find that on our Chesapeake Urology homepage and our Chesapeake Urology YouTube channel. As Dr. Mendez said, Chesapeake Urology has telehealth and in-person appointments available, so please visit us at chesapeakeurology.com for more information. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye, guys. Take care.